And in some cases, um, and what I've done in my own work is I'll sometimes add these variables together, or these measures together, and I'll come up with a composite score that would range from 3 to 21. So somebody that was scoring on a 21, I would say, is very, very high on intentions versus someone that would be, um, let's say, for example, a 10, would be have, have moderate level of intentions. The next construct is an attitude. Now, an attitude is comprised of two components, a behavioral belief and an, out and an evaluation of the behavioral outcome. And I'm going to talk specifically about each of these, the behavioral beliefs and, and the evaluation of the behavioral outcomes. So the behavioral belief is the belief that behavioral performance is associated with certain attributes or outcomes. Um, now, I hope what you're, what you're thinking right now is that that's very similar to a construct you've seen in another theory. And in fact, it is. It's similar to the outcome expectation that we learned about in social cognitive theory. So uh, again, the, it's, it's the belief that, that a behavioral performance is associated with certain attributes or outcomes. So for example, a person who believes that exercise is likely to tone muscles is likely to exercise because they would have a high behavioral belief or outcome expectation. And to use some of the same examples that we used when we were talking about social cognitive theory, if I exercise, I will lose weight. If I eat a healthy diet, I will feel better. If I engage in protected sex, I am likely to avoid uh, an STI or unwanted pregnancy or HIV. Here are some examples of how behavioral beliefs were measured in this project done by the World Health Organization. And these are uh, from the perspective of the primary care physician in, again, in Sub-Saharan Africa. If I measure there, referring to patients, blood pressure, I feel, will feel that I am doing something positive for the patient. It causes a lot of worry and concern for a diabetes patient if they are found to have high blood pressure. If I measure blood pressure, I will detect any problems at an early stage. If I measure blood pressure, I've got to see patients more often. Now, some of these are very practical, and you can see the connection between the behavior and the outcome. Um, for example, um, uh, the second item is one that's very common among individuals who should be tested or screened for HIV. And many of them will report that they do not want to be screened because they don't want to know the outcome. They don't want to find out that they're HIV positive. Um, it, it's also this third one, if I measure blood pressure, I will detect any problems at an early stage. That also, uh, parallel items might be uh, relevant for studies of breast cancer detection and things like that. That if I am screened, if I get a mammography early, I will detect problems at an early stage. So to the extent that people believe that by being getting a mammography, they will detect early stage breast cancer, then they would be more likely to engage in the behavior. Okay, so the, the complement then to the behavioral belief is the outcome evaluation. Now the outcome evaluation is very similar to the outcome expectancy that we discussed in social cognitive theory. And that is the value attached to a behavioral outcome or attribute. For example, a person who believes that exercise is likely to tone muscles, but does not care about how toned his or her muscles are, is unlikely to exercise. So, I don't care about losing weight. I don't care about avoiding HIV. Those are examples of outcome evaluations. Again, the value that I place on the outcome, or an outcome expect expectancy, as we uh, learned in social cognitive theory. Here, here are examples, again, from the perspective of the provider. Doing something positive for the patient is extremely undesirable to extremely desirable. For these patients, detecting problems at an early stage is extremely desire, undesirable to extremely desirable. Now, what you'll probably notice here is that these two constructs, they, they, they interact with each other. They work together. So, for example, 
if you go back to the examples of the behavioral belief and say that um, if I measure blood pressure, I will detect any problems at an early stage, which is doing something positive for the patient, and that's extremely desirable. So to the extent that it's very desirable to do something positive for the patient, which it should be for most physicians, and that by screening for high blood pressure, then I will detect any problems at an early stage, if that's likely, then it's likely that I, as a, as a primary care physician, would engage in that behavior. By contrast, if I don't think that's likely to result in me uh, detecting anything at an early stage that would be useful, um, and, <clears throat> and, and I don't generally believe that it's my responsibility as a physician to be doing this uh, um, so it may not be all that positive, uh, then I'm not likely to engage in the behavior. I might also, there might be circumstances in the developing in, in a developing world setting where um, detecting the problem, if there's no solution or outcome, might create a lot of worry and anxiety that um, I'm not saying isn't justified but may not be warranted in the context of our inability to provide additional services for the patient. Therefore, am I really doing something positive for the patient would be a question that, that might frequently be asked. Okay, so the next construct is the subjective norm. Subjective norms refer to one's belief that most of the significant others in one's life uh, think whether or not one should perform the behavior. Now that's kind of a confusing statement, but let me explain it a little bit more. Uh, so it's the, it, well, and, and, and the subjective norm, let me say, is comprised of normative beliefs and motivation to comply. Now, I'm going to talk about each of these. First, the normative belief. So it's the belief about whether each referent approves or disapproves of the behavior. So, for example, if a person believes that his or her family members approve of his or her walking, waking up early every morning to jog, well then he or she is more likely to jog. So this might also be true when talking about adolescence and substance abuse. Who might my referent groups be? And what do they think about me engaging in the behavior? So my reference might be, and we know this from, uh, from, from, from research that we've conducted recently among adolescents related to smoking. The reference are likely to be, and by referent I mean the group of people that are important to them or to whom they might refer to determine whether or not they think they should engage in the behavior. And they're likely to be peers, parents, and socialites or very kind of socially uh, affluent people, celebrities, for example. So, as an adolescent, I might look to my peers and say, what do they think about me engaging in this behavior? What do they think about me smoking? What do they expect me to smoke? Do they think I should smoke? In some ways that I might be able to ascertain that is I might say, well, if most of them smoke, then they probably think it's important for me to smoke or if they've ever invited me to smoke. I might also say, uh, look at parents as reference and say, uh, what do I know about their opinions with respect to me smoking? Do they smoke? Have we ever had discussions about what they think I should do? Do they think I should smoke? Do they think I should not smoke? Socialites or celebrities, how do I know? Well, I see them smoking. I see them smoking in tabloids. One very, very important uh, uh, level of influence related to socialites and adolescent smoking is movies, popular television shows, uh, media and entertainment. Uh, we know that if a, if, if a celebrity smokes on screen, meaning in a movie or on television, adolescents are much more likely to initiate smoking or to experiment with smoking. Again, they're referencing the referent. They're saying, what does that person think about my behavior? Do they approve of my behavior? Do they think I should engage in the behavior? Now, it's complemented by, 
and, and let me also just uh, show you. So um, here, uh, primary care physicians, um, who are their reference groups? Uh, well, other providers. So the third one down, other general practitioners. Um, do they measure blood, blood, blood pressure of their patients with diabetes? So uh, what, are other, what are my peers doing? Um, the government, for example, uh, on the last item. That's an important one. So think about um, what do you know about uh, vaccinations in the United States and with the recent um, H1N1 outbreak. What was the CDC telling us? What was our local health department telling us? Well, the CDC thought it was important for, um, for, for certain categories of people to be vaccinated. What about the flu shot each year? Yes, the county health department thinks it's important for me to be vaccinated. People who are important to me, the county health department, perhaps government, physicians, they think I should be vaccinated. They think I should uh, engage in that preventative behavior. Now, the normative belief is complemented by something that we call the motivation to comply. Motivation to comply uh, is, is a kind of a basic measure of my, my personal motivation to engage in those behaviors that, the, that my referent group thinks I should do or thinks as, is important. And that's kind of uh, a, a complicated construct in as much as it's very simple, but it's very related to the normative belief. So let me explain it a little bit more. So take two groups of people, let's say peers and parents, and let's talk about smoking. And I might say, my peers think that I should smoke based on all of them smoking, um, or at least experimenting with cigarettes, and they continue to invite me 